Swanson. Dr. James, I've been keeping house for you for the last five years. Yes, I know. You like the windows closed, but I like them open. Well, it's beyond me how you can work on your Sunday sermon with all this noise that's driving me to distraction. <laughs> now, now, it's not as bad as all that. Besides, my address for tomorrow isn't a sermon. What I'm working on is an appeal to the generosity of our members to support our missions. Now that I'm for, too. If you ask me, we could use a mission right here in this neighborhood. Hey, come on. Oh, Dr. James, can't you do something about the children playing out in the street? Do you realize how dangerous it is? You mean, uh, for them or for your nerves? Both. But I think you should do something about it. Well, now I know the street isn't the best place for youngsters to play, but, uh, but where else can they play? I wonder what they're running from. The police, no doubt. Mm, poor little ragamuffins, taught to run from the law almost as soon as they learn to walk. What a pity. If you ask me, I think it's a blessing. At least we'll have a few minutes of peace. Peace isn't always a matter of physical quietness, Mrs. Swanson. Real peace comes from within oneself. Sometimes a person's mind may be in utter turmoil amidst deadly silence while another may be completely at rest in a boiler factory. Well, be that as it may, Doctor. Me, I'm a woman that likes a happy medium. Well, there goes the sexton toward the church with the flowers. Now, if you've got your mind set on having everything just right at the service tomorrow, I'd say you'd better go fix things yourself before he gets them all messed up beyond fixing. Maybe you're right, Mrs. Swanson. How are you getting along? Hello, Doctor. What'd you say? I said, how are you getting along? Fine, fine. How's that? Pretty good, eh? That's very good. But uh, you won't mind if I help you a little, will you? You see, Bibbins, tomorrow is a very special day. Is it? Yes, indeed. Tomorrow, this church and I start a new life. Our denomination needs more missionaries. So I must arouse our members, shake them out of their apathy. That's why I'd like to have everything just right. The music, the flower. Oh, no. That's what they were running from. The stained winter of Christ. Now, how do you suppose it? Oh. I always said those boys ought to be chased away. Yes, yes, Mrs. Swanson has said it too. But that doesn't help now. really blame those children? Am I not just as guilty? Perhaps even more so. After all, what have I ever done for those youngsters? 
Oh, sure, I've invited them to Sunday school, and I've visited their dingy flats. But have I really demonstrated to them the love and compassion of Jesus? Have I ever challenged my congregation to help those needy people, to do something for those children in the shadow of our own church? Pardon me, Doctor. Oh, yes? There's a boy out there left a message for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, he's gone now. He wasn't dressed fit to come in. Not dressed fit? Mrs. Swanson, don't ever say that again. I'm sorry. But you should know by now that any boy with any problem can come here at any time of the day or night. Excuse me, Doctor. He left this note for you. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Swanson. Dear Preach, I smacked the ball through your window. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. They say you're a right guy and you won't squeal. But even if you sick the cops on me, I'll pay for the window. Eight cents is all I got. I'll send more soon as I get some. Your friend. Eight cents. Poor kid. Wasn't it Mark who said? And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites. Yes. Hers wasn't much of a contribution either. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all. Only eight cents. But can I make a contribution just as worthy? I have chosen for my text this morning a few words from the teachings of Jesus. Words which are well known, but which we take too lightly, too often. You'll find them in the 25th chapter of Matthew. They read as follows. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. My friends, I've had a very strange experience. Something has happened to me. Something which I'm sure will color what I have to say today. I shall give you no platitudes, no pretty phrases. Today we'll get down to earth, down to smelly apartment houses and boys playing in dingy streets. I've noticed how many of you have been looking at that broken window, wondering how such a sacrilegious accident could have happened in a house of the Lord. Perhaps some of you would like to know who is responsible for this. I'll tell you. We are. You and I. Yes, we are responsible because we've been too complacent, too smug and self-satisfied. No, we didn't actually break the window. This ball did it. And when it came hurtling through that window, it ripped out the beautiful head of Christ. 
Let us contemplate this headless figure for a moment. Then ask ourselves, if Christ is the head of our church, should we not be a serving church, ministering in his name to the spiritual and physical needs of our neighbors and friends, such as the boy who threw this ball? My friends, that boy isn't responsible for this broken window. We are. Because we've given too much lip service and not enough of the Christian spirit. We've neglected our spiritual obligations to that boy. This ball and this window have jarred my soul. And I hope it will jar yours and make us all realize that this church must dedicate itself to a mission. A mission not only unto the uttermost parts of the earth, but right here at home. A mission in the nearby parking lots. A recreation hall, a clinic, a day nursery, all of the things that this neighborhood needs for a better life. And we must give sacrificially to such a program. As sacrificially as did the child who sent me these. These eight pennies came from the boy who broke that window. I don't know who he is, and we aren't going to find out. The note that came with the pennies said that this was his first payment on that window. So here is that boy's first offering, truly given in the Christian spirit. I shall make the second toward the establishment of a definite program through which we can discharge our Christian responsibility to the people of our community. I have been offered $10,000 for the house in which I live. That will be my contribution. And I pray that my gift may be as pleasing to God as I feel these eight pennies to be. Well, if you ask me, Doctor, I'd say you were out of your mind. And if you ask me, Mrs. Swanson, I'd say I never felt better in my whole life. Yes, if this wall hadn't struck that window, we'd still be in the same old rut. But now, now we're on our way I'll to... I'll say you are. Now you're going to live in a dingy old flat. And for what, may I ask? Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. all I got. I'll send more as soon as I get some. Your friend. Mr. Arden, the new owner of your house is here to see you, Doctor. Well, have him come in. This way, Mr. Arden. Oh, good morning. Come in, come in. Good morning, Doctor. I found I it tucked came... under the door, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Would you, would you excuse me for just a moment? Surely. Uh, sit down, please. Well, thank you. It's, it's another offering from the boy who broke the window. Forty-five cents this time. Well, I may be around to see that new window after all. Oh, don't you worry. You'll see the new window, all right. And many other things, too. Well, Mr. Arden, 
It looks like we'll be all packed and ready to move out by the end of the week. Uh, that's what I wanted to see you about. I know you've gone to a lot of trouble uh, to move out hurriedly, but, well, I suddenly find myself in a most awkward position. Yes? And my family refuses to move in. Now, the way my wife puts it, she feels if you can afford to give up your home, we can afford to let you stay in it. You mean... You mean you want to cancel the sale? No, no. I mean, uh, I'd like to have you stay as my tenant. I know that you've paid a month's rent on an apartment, but I could credit you with that. Mr. Arden, I... I can't tell you how much this means to me. May I... May I ask how much the rent would be? Well, shall we say $20 a month, Doctor? 20 a month? Why, why, you could rent this for 65, at least 50 any day of the year. I suppose so, but it's just like my wife says. And if that boy can send you 45 cents, I guess I can afford to rent you the place for $20. I hope that you'll stay. I will, but only on one condition. The rent must be at least the same amount that I was ready to pay for the apartment. All right, doctor, you've got yourself a new landlord. <laughs> Thank you so much. And God bless you. Oh, uh, I'll try to be a good tenant and uh, have the rent on time. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Goodbye, doctor. Goodbye. All this work gone for nothing. Now we've got to unpack all these things and... Uh, Bivens, uh, didn't you hear the good news? What'd you say? I said, unpack everything. We're not moving. Well, I never. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Doctor. Yes? Well, if you ask me, I still think you're crazy to have sold your house, but... Well, you're wonderful, Doctor. God is wonderful, Mrs. Swanson. <laughs> is more kindly, more compassionate than the previous one. You really think so? Maybe not. Perhaps the difference is only in my own heart. And yet, looking at it now, it gives me such courage. I guess what you've started will require courage, Doctor. Yes. Uh, how are you coming along with the project? It's a much bigger job than it looked, Mr. Arden. Even though our members are responding generously, there's so much to do, so much to accomplish, and so little to do it with, sometimes it frightens me. And then, then I think of the words of Jesus. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be. I believe that, Mr. Arden. It can be done, and will be done, in his name. But this isn't for business, Tony. We want it for a recreation hall for the youngsters. See, si. see, si, I know, Pastor, but I got to get to some rent, you know? You know we can't afford to pay rent, Tony. Pastor, please. I like for be good the guy, but if I know that... <laughs> you, uh... You okay, son? Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, well, why don't you kids stop playing in the middle of the street? I have father's mustache. Where else are we gonna play? Mamma mia. Those are kids. They drive me crazy. Every day, one of them is almost to get the kill. Tony, you have a boy just about that age, haven't you? <laughs> see, si, see. Si. He plays in the street too, doesn't he? Not if I catch him. <laughs> but the summertimes I no catch. 
that boy just a moment ago might have been killed. And that boy, Tony, might have been your son. See, see, it could have been my kid. Okie dokie, Passator. The starchy is yours. Oh, thank you, Tony, and God bless you. The boys will appreciate your generosity, too. Passator, please. I am not the generous. How I know. Maybe my kid, he's the one who broke the window. <laughs> <laughs> feel good inside. This is only a small beginning, Tony. There's much more to be done. And I might as well get on with it now. I have an appointment to keep with Mr. McGregor. And I go right along with you. You let Tony make it the pitch, huh? I tell that skinny Flint he's got to listen. Oh, all right, come along, Tony. <laughs> now, why do you have to have this lot? You already have a recreation center for the boys. Yes, but that's only a small room, Mr. McGregor. Uh, mostly for rainy days. See, si, see. Si. The kids, they have to have a nicer place to play when the sun is shining, too. Well, I don't know about that, but I... This lot would be wonderful. Large enough for the boys to play all kinds of ball games, and, and perhaps later we could afford a swimming pool. Swimming pool? Well, uh, just a, a small one. Mr. McGregor, don't you see what this would mean for those boys and for our church? Mr. James, I've turned down a lease for $100 a month. But since it's for a good cause, you can have it for 50 50 You crazy? You want for someone to pay you to clean up your own dirty lot so your own kids have a nicer place to play, huh? Now, look, your boy and the rest of the boys will be playing here, too. I only wish we could pay rent, Mr. McGregor. For why he should get the pay, huh? Look, Mac, you know that the big window in the church? How much you think she cost? Well, I don't know. An awful lot, I suppose. You bet for you. And the Mac. How you know maybe it wasn't one of your own the kids which you break it at the window? Well, I don't know. And listen to this too, Mac. Maybe you like a more better this dirty old lot than your own the kids. Maybe more better you like take a chance. One of your nicest, sweet little kids get a kill in the street. Oh, well, for the kids and for the church, you can have the lot. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Thank you. <laughs> oh, look at that one. <laughs> You know, I'm mighty glad you talked me into this. Does my heart good to see the kids off the street. <laughs> well, Pastor, now you can relax, huh? Relax, Tony? Could you relax if you'd received this? You read a Max. I know read English is so good. Dear Reverend, I've been sick and I couldn't work. That's why I can only send you $2. I see that the window's been fixed, but I still want to pay for it. Next month, I start high school. I'll get a better job evenings and send you more money. Your friend. No, my friends, we can't relax. There's still too much to be done. We need a medical clinic, a day nursery. Oh, but Mr. James, that, that boy, aren't you going to look him up? No, he asked me not to. See, si, see, si. but you should tell him his money. You no need her so much now like before. And deprive him of the inner satisfaction he gets from doing this? No, no, Tony. Someday, when he's ready, we'll know who he is. In the meanwhile, his little gifts will spur us on and keep us doing good unto all men. In his name.
Dear Dr. James, sorry I can only send five dollars, but I had to buy my graduation sweater this week. It may take a long time, but somehow I'll pay in full. Meanwhile, the wonderful things you've done are a constant inspiration to me. I'll be a better man because of you. Your friend. My boy, if only you knew what an inspiration you've been to me. Oh, Father, thank you for the broken window and by it showing me your will. Please take care of our friend. stopping you from anything, am I? No, no, not at all, Don. This week is a little easier for me. I have no sermon to prepare. Oh? Who's going to be in the pulpit Sunday? Uh, one of those young graduates from the seminary. <laughs> Our congregation has to have some relief, you know. Who wants to hear the same old voice, see the same old face? We love that same old face, Doctor. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Be that as it may, I'm going to invite more of these younger men, and more often. It's a big help to them. It gives them poise and confidence. It's good for us, too. They have fire and enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> You're still uh, here from your little friend? No, not for a long while. But I still pray for him, and I shall always be grateful. For deep in my heart, I know that our people can never sink back into that old, comfortable rut. Not while this ball is here to remind us of our Christian obligation. My friends, today we have a guest in our pulpit, a young man who's made a remarkable record at the seminary. From what I understand, God has used him in marvelous ways. Therefore, I'm very happy to present to you the Reverend John Taylor. Please, forgive me. This is an unusual occasion. My text is one short verse from the book of Matthew, one which I'm sure is familiar to all of you. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. To me, that is a memorable text because it was the turning point in my life when I heard it spoken by a certain minister. You see, I was converted in a mission near a great church. It wasn't a great church because of its size or wealth. 
but it was great because, because it had a pastor who was possessed with the spirit of Christ. A man who was capable of imparting that spirit to his congregation. Yes, it was that pastor who, by his deeds, showed me what Christianity really means. From him, I learned that Christ lived and died for all people, including urchins who roam the streets. Yet I never joined that church because I was afraid. Afraid I'd be despised by the other members for what I'd done. Through the years, I have carried a heavy burden. But now I'm no longer afraid. Doctor, would you please stand beside me? I have a public confession to make to you and your congregation. I was the boy who broke your window. You? Oh, my son. Tell me, doctor, was the one I broke as beautiful as this one? In my heart, this one will always be more beautiful. Doctor, you, you'll never know what a momentous occasion this is for me. But for your ministry, that shattered window would have broken my life. But because you ministered unto one of the very least of these, now I may minister today. My friends, this is indeed an answer to our prayer. For years we have served, and now here before us stands the proof that our striving was not in vain. And as Christ is the head of our church, may his spirit so kindle our hearts that no sacrifice will ever be too great, no task will ever be too difficult for us to do in his name. Amen.